So our scripture today on this Transfiguration Sunday is first the story of the Transfiguration as found in Luke's Gospel, the ninth chapter, and then followed by an event in the lives of Peter and John in Acts chapter three. Hear the word of God. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. And suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now, Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. And while he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. And then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him, and just then a man from the crowd shouted, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son. He's my only child. And suddenly a spirit seizes him, and all at once he shrieks. It convulses him until he foams at the mouth. It mauls him and will scarcely leave him. I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, you faithless and perverse generation, how much longer must I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. And while he was coming, the demon dashed him to the ground in convulsions. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And all were astounded at the greatness of God. Acts chapter three, one day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer at three o'clock in the afternoon, and a man, lame from birth, was being carried in. And people would lay him daily at the gate of the temple, called the beautiful gate, so that he could ask for alms from those entering the temple. And when he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. And Peter looked intently at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Stand up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Jumping up, he stood and began to walk and enter the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. This is the word of the Lord. God. Let us pray. By your grace and through your mercy, we pray, O Lord, that you allow these words to come to point to the word just read and to the word made flesh in Jesus the Christ, where we pray this in his name, amen. Life is a climb, sometimes up the mountain, sometimes down the mountain, and sometimes, and usually only for a moment, to the top of the mountain. In January 1955, Jill Kinmont was on the top of the mountain. Recently, she had become the U.S. slalom champion, was deemed one of the great hopes for the U.S. Olympic team as they prepared to compete in the 1956 Winter Olympics in Cortina, Italy. Sports Illustrated that month featured her on the cover of their magazine. You don't get much higher up the mountain in the world of competitive sports than to win the U.S. championship, be deemed a great hope to represent your country at the pinnacle of international competition and to have your face donning the cover of the nation's premier sports magazine. In the same week, however, when her face and name appeared on the cover of Sports Illustrated, 19-year-old Jill Kinmont in a race in Utah hit a rough patch of ice, took a terrible fall, broke her neck, and in an instant was left without the use of her legs and most of the use of her arms. 
Her early life and accident and recovery became the subject of a 1976 movie called The Other Side of the Mountain, a movie, parenthetically, to which I took a fellow freshman on our first date, which started something that is still going 45 years later. <laughs> life is a climb, sometimes up the mountain, sometimes down the mountain, and sometimes, and usually only for a moment, to the top of the mountain. I suppose each of us, if asked, could come up with what we would consider for ourselves a mountaintop experience. It's usually something very personal, something that reveals a certain passion or a certain value you hold dearly. Maybe you have risen to the top of your profession and you have been so recognized. Maybe you have completed a lifetime goal or project. Maybe you've traveled somewhere that you've always wanted to see. Maybe you have managed to accumulate amount, an amount of money that you always hoped you would accumulate. Maybe you have come to possess something you always dreamed of possessing. Maybe you've written a book. Maybe you have found a life Mate. Maybe you have sensed your family is finally in a good place. Maybe you got first place in competition. Maybe you got Wordle on the first try. <laughs> and if you don't know what Wordle is, it means you're a healthy human being. <laughs> and now you're all reaching for your phones and trying to Google Wordle, right? If given the time, I suppose we could all come up with what we would consider a mountaintop experience to which we are ascending or from which we are descending. Makes me think of Larry Walters. You've heard of Larry Walters, I imagine. Larry Walters was a truck driver out in Los Angeles, California, and Larry's life was driving trucks during the week and sitting home in his Sears lawn chair and drinking six packs on the weekend. But it's there that Larry got an inspiration. He got an idea for a mountaintop experience. So Larry went out and bought himself 45 weather balloons, filled them with helium, tied them to the arms and back of a Sears lawn chair, got himself a radio, some sandwiches, a couple soft drinks, and a BB gun. He took the BB gun because if he started flying at some point, he'd have to come down, and he figured he'd shoot out some of the balloons to get him down again. His mountaintop goal was about 100 feet, so Larry got all these balloons ready, cut the rope that was tying his chair to the ground, and Larry began to ascend. Do not try this at home. And he started to climb 10 feet, 20 feet, 50 feet, 100 feet. He reached 100 feet in his Sears lawn chair. But the balloons and the chair didn't stop there, 150 feet, 500 feet, 1,000 feet, 5,000 feet, 10,000 feet, 15,000 feet, 16,000 feet. That's three miles in the air. I think that qualifies for a mountaintop experience. A Continental Airlines flight approaching Los Angeles radioed into the control tower. Uh, we got a guy up here in a lawn chair with sandwiches and a BB gun. <laughs> but what goes up must come down, and Larry finally started shooting his balloons and started descending back down to earth, but he had failed to install a navigational system. Larry's balloons caught onto some power lines, and he knocked out power to Long Beach for two hours. <laughs> Life is a climb sometimes up the mountain, sometimes down the mountain, and sometimes, and usually only for a moment, to the top of the mountain. November 22nd, 2013, London, England. I'm sitting in Westminster Abbey with three of my dear friends. It is the 50th anniversary of the death of my theological and spiritual grandfather, C.S. Lewis. The Abbey has been closed to all visitors, except a few hundred of us who are there to participate in a worship service of thanksgiving and for the laying of a stone in Poet's Corner, commemorating the life and writing of this man who shaped the Christian world and thought. The Archbishop of Canterbury presides, the Abbey Boy Choir sings, former students speak, his literary curator and his stepson unveil the stone, and in a way I cannot describe, I feel that heaven is touching the earth and for a moment I dwell in what the cults call the thin place. Overwhelmed with such gratitude and glory, I say to myself, who am I to be here? And joy fills my heart and tears stream down my cheeks. 
mountaintop. I don't expect anyone to understand that, nor would I begin to understand yours, nor should anyone expect to understand what took place on that mountaintop in northern Palestine where Jesus ascended with his three disciples. We, we can't be sure of which mountain it was. We, we don't know how long it took them to climb, but when the summit had been reached, the unexplainable happened. Figures of Israel's great prophets appear, and Jesus takes on a radiance, and grace and holiness and power and spirit encircle the three prophets and the three disciples, and this is a moment that no one wants to end, and Peter finds himself in that thin place between heaven and earth, and, and who would ever want to leave that? So he suggests the only reasonable thing Thing to suggest, which is to pitch some tents, put down some stakes, lay claim to the moment, and make permanent our dwelling here on the mountaintop. Once again, Peter says, the very thing I would say, only to learn that it's the wrong thing to say, because it's the very nature of the mountaintop that it's only for a moment, only for a moment, an important moment, a moment meant for something. Mountaintops are always meant for something. Glory and grace in thin places are meant for something. They are meant for the other side of the mountain because there comes a time when the cloud lifts and the prophets leave and the radiance quells and the grace subsides and it's time to go down. So they follow Jesus and they go down. They follow Jesus going up and they follow Jesus going down. Do you understand that? Sometimes Jesus takes us up the mountain and even sometimes to the top, but other times he takes us down the mountain. But wherever Jesus takes us, there is glory to be revealed. So when Jesus and the disciples go down the side of the mountain, there they find a dad in trouble, a dad who doesn't know what to do. His son is uncontrollable. His son is not well. His son is going to hurt himself. And now there, there's a healing to be done. Now there is glory again to be revealed. There's glory on top of the mountain, and there's a different glory on the other side of the mountain. Same mountain, different sides, a different glory. Wherever there is a human being, there is glory. Everlasting splendors, C.S. Lewis called them. And maybe that's what Peter and John have in their mind when they are walking up to the temple. Let's not forget that in those early days, the early disciples were still worshiping and in the temple, and the temple was likely the place where they recounted all those mountaintop experiences with Jesus. Jesus turning water into wine, Jesus walking on the water, Jesus feeding the 5,000, Jesus healing the blind man, Jesus raising the dead Lazarus, Jesus taking Peter and John and James up the mountain and being transfigured before them. And, and then on top of all, the empty tomb and the resurrected Jesus appearing behind closed doors and beside the sea. I mean, you and I might have a couple mountaintop experiences in our life, but these disciples have had mountaintop experience after mountaintop experience, and where better to bask in the afterglow of such thin places than in the temple praising God and rejoicing? But there comes a time to pay attention to inside the temple and outside the temple, to the top of the mountain and to the side of the mountain. And what should those disciples find on their way into the temple but the man who cannot walk? There's a glory to be found inside the temple and there's a glory outside the temple. And it's the glory of another human being. It's the glory of the yearning to be healed, to be made whole. And now the disciples get to be the medium of the miracle. Now they get to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to be the channels of the Spirit. They get to be witnesses to the glory. You see, there are all sorts of sides to the mountain. There's the top, there's the bottom, and there's the in-between. And Jesus takes us everywhere, for we are reflections of the glory. We are manifestations of Christ. And everywhere we go is the opportunity to follow Jesus, to be his hands and feet, to be his healing touch, to be his holy presence. Which takes me back to what Paul Harvey would call the rest of the story. For there is a rest of the story when it comes to Jill Kinmont, thrown from the top of the mountain to the deepest valley, where she then sought healing and meaning and purpose. 
And the purpose led her to college, and college led her to a calling, and the calling was to teach, to teach special needs children. Who better to teach special needs children than a special needs teacher? But they said to her that you kind of people can't teach. You can't use your legs. You can barely use your arms, so you cannot teach. Oh, yes, she can. And whatever strength she possessed to take her up the mountain was the same strength she used to go down the mountain, and she persisted, and finally they said yes. And Jill Kenmont Booth, for now she's married a truck driver, this one a little more down to earth than Larry Walters, found herself a school and a classroom and became the channel of glory to kids just like her. For 35 years, every day adding to the wholeness of those yearning for knowledge and companion. And when they built a new school for those kids, the student body rose up and demanded that the school be named the Jill Kenmont Booth School. Shore Beats, a Sports Illustrated cover. And so on this day of dedication, where might Jesus be taking us? On, on what side of the mountain are we called? What, what healing is there to be done? What, what person stands outside our temple or down our mountain that needs the healing touch of Jesus? Today we commit our lives to the ministry of this church by offering our pledges. The Church of the Palms may seek God's glory inside these walls and outside these walls, and then maybe, as our first step, we'll head over to the courtyard, we'll grab one of those reverse offering envelopes, and we will wonder, just wonder, where does Jesus want me to take this? Where does Jesus want me to go? Where is the healing that needs to take place? How might I let this little thing become a big thing to reveal the glory of God? Helmut Tillica said that the gospel is always being forwarded to a new address. Mountaintops are meant for something. Summits lead to valleys and everywhere in between. For there too is the glory there too are human beings. There too are everlasting splendors. There too is the purpose of Christ. There too we become the medium of the miracle.